Um, we're going to go over the different families in general of the colors that we have. We have 266 colors, so I'm briefly going to touch on those. Um, one I get asked about quite a bit, no matter where I go, is what, what, are the, what minerals from the Primatex, John, can you find in my country? And this right here just shows you, for example, Amazonite, the location of it, which is Brazil, shows you the massive, it shows you the pigment, and it shows you the drawdown. So if you're interested in that information, that's online. Primatech is primitive technology. Um, both Dan and I have a real admiration for the Plains Indians that's in the center of the United States. Uh, they would find minerals, they would find ochres and siennas, etc., in riverbeds. They would crush those down, they'd put them into an animal fat, and they'd wear them as war paint or, or, or paint for their bodies or for their horses. It has maintained itself in the coastal Indians, for example, where there's totem poles. A lot of those totem poles are hundreds and hundreds of years old. Uh, the paint on them is still beautiful and vibrant, and much of that came from ochres and siennas, etc. So we thought that would be a beautiful thing to bring forward to uh, artists throughout the world, which is why we um, found minerals that would uh, allow us to make them into paint. It is a lot of testing. There's a lot of toxicology that has to go through. You can't just use any mineral that you pick up. Before we turn any of it to paint, we go through both toxicology in the US and we have toxicology that we use for here in the UK. We do both, so we do double toxicology. Um, just lots of steps to go through. And one is just to make sure that my, my staff is safe. By making sure that my staff is safe, I make sure that you as the artists are safe. It's, it's a beautiful process. It's a process that I really, really love. Um, the granulation on the minerals is, is um, more like a, a martial art. It's, it's, a, it's a flow of energy. It's a, it's, a, it's a dance that you want to allow to happen on its own, encourage it, versus a synthetic where you can really be um, really beat it up and be mean to it because it's such high strength, etc. So I, I hope you like both of those. So I wanted to show you just some of the colors, really, the families. Um, these, for example, these are going to be synthetics. These are the pyrroles. Um, while ultramarine blue is certainly my favorite, the pyrroles are really beautiful. They're just really beautiful colors. They're very strong. They're just, they're just I think they're just beautiful. The ones that are kind of a step down from the pyrroles, but are just as beautiful in their way, are the perilines. Again, synthetic. Quite beautiful. We talked about lunar colors. These are some of the lunar colors. Lunar blue, lunar violet, lunar red, lunar earth. And this one, which we're gonna test in a moment, lunar black. And, and this one, I think I mentioned, is the only one that kind of violates the rule for granulation because these are all the same size, all the same shape, all the same weight. And they're nanoparticles that don't want to stay together with each other, so they cause this granulation. So they're kind of an anomaly. And so lunar black is a very granulating color. And it's kind of unique. The one thing I have to learn is how much water to use. So what I want to show you is the, the granulation. The more that we would take time with this, the more granulation you're going to see. It's a very granulating color. You can see how fast it's going to granulate. Uh, I get asked sometimes if I use hot pressed paper, will I get granulation? If a, if a pigment granulates, you're going to get granulation. So it'll be more radially, like a little raindrop, versus fall in the valley on a rough piece of paper, for example. So the neat thing about lunar black versus a lamp black, for example, is if we give this time, the black will move away from the yellow. So it'll still be very, it'll be very vibrant. It'll just get more vibrant as we give it time. We do have two fugitive colors. Fugitive means, you know, here today, gone tomorrow, 20 years, 25 years. And we have two of them. We have alizarin crimson, which is a coal tar derivative. It was used by the masters. 
Um, many, many professors have their students use this color because the masters used it. They understand that it's fugitive, but they want their students to, to use what the masters used to, as a learning um, example, learning practice. For you as the professional artist, we also have permanent lizard crimson, which is a series of pigments that we put together to match lizard crimson, but it's permanent. It's 100 plus years. This right here, so lizard crimson is one. Opera pink is the other. Opera pink is the fluorescent. It's really quite beautiful. I made this for the Botanical Society. They wanted a fluorescent to do um, botanical drawings with. Um, I told them I wouldn't do it. They all met me after the show and said, you know, we understand we're professional painters. Um, and they were, they were very, very good. So I decided I would come out with one. So we came out with Opera Pink. Fluorescents are only gonna last 20, 25 years in sunlight. You can always make it last longer by putting it behind um, conservation glass or in, in a, in, out of direct sunlight, etc. There's always ways to do that. But even if the fluorescent went totally away, underneath the fluorescent, we have quinacridone magenta. And quinacridone magenta is 100 plus years. So even when the fluorescent goes away, the quinacridone magenta portion will still be there. It just won't be this vibrant. It's a very beautiful color. Other colors that we have, we have CAD U's about ah, probably 13 years ago, at least 13 years ago, I moved away from cadmiums. And um, I didn't want my I didn't want my staff using them. I didn't want them part of the, the business. So I moved away from those. We use high performance co-precipitated pigments that have similar opacity, as good if not better, and vibrancy as good if not better. Um, so they're CAD U's. They're they're quite beautiful. You'd get the same uh, same beauty as a cadmium without being cadmiums. These are environmental friendly oxides right here. There's, there's three of them. There's brown, yellow, and red. Um, we work with a company in the United States that goes through streams that have been polluted by the automobile industry or other industry over you know 100 years. And they will process the sediment in, in cleaning up that river. And we will buy the, um, the oxide from them. So it's more than just an oxide that we get synthetically on the marketplace. And the differential between those two costs, they use to do the next cleanup. So it's a way to give back and you know, be one of the corporations that gives money to clean up the streams, et cetera. Um, end of the day, we all live on the same planet, just a good thing to do. So those are why they're environmental friendly brown oxides. This is Cascade Green. Cascade Green is a co-precipitated color, much like the cadmiums. It just means that it's two pigments that have been locked into one. The neat thing with watercolor is that when you add the watercolor, it breaks the bond of the Cascade Green into those two pigments. And you can get these beautiful yellows, blues, and greens in this particular color. It's, it's a pretty awesome color. The luminescents are made of four families. So there's the pearlescent, there's the iridescent, there's the interference, and there's the duochrome. Those are the four that make up the luminescent. The pearlescent has pearlescent white and pearlescent shimmer, both the same pigment. One just has a larger particle, that's the shimmer. Otherwise, they're both exactly the same. You may see that going down the street as um, on, on a car used a lot. Iridescent. Iridescent is a reflective color so you can see it over dark and you can see it over light. Interference. You can see it over dark not so much over a light. And duochromes is one pigment that shifts to two colors and is made up of both iridescent and interference. Um, these are used by many people uh, in eyes and watercolor can have a tendency to have dead eyes 
where you know when the when the paint dries, it looks like a dead eye. It's a great way to add life to an eye. Uh, Daniel Smith Luminescent, you can see many, many different ways that people have used them. Certainly on, on beetles and dragonflies and dragons and all that, but also the serious artisan and how they use it. So it, it, it can be very complimentary for you.